All right, welcome everybody to Why Your Site is Slow, Midcamp 2016, day two. I'm Steve Persh, an agency and community engineer at Pantheon. So I come from a background of building individual Drupal sites. I, I previously worked at Palantir.net and some other agencies in Chicago. I now live in Milwaukee. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Drupal.org, just about everywhere as Steve Vector. You can also find me on Twitter as Drupal Haikus, uh, something I still occasionally tweet as. Haikus all about Drupal. So today we're going to be covering key architectural points related to the speed of a website. We'll be breaking this presentation into two main parts, the server side of web performance, the client side of web performance, and as much as possible, I'll try to highlight the underlying why of each technological area. Why do we care about the, the common recommendations that we hear related to performance, and why are they difficult to implement? Often these technological suggestions are difficult to implement because there are people involved, and there are complex organizations involved, and uh, when you have a large group of people involved, technical solutions can can mask underlying governance problems. So let's, let's start with a really simple overview of what a website does. A website sends responses from a server over a network to be interpreted by a browser. Often the conversation around web performance gets really technical, really fast, and that complexity can mask what's happening at the simplest level. We're sending responses over a network to be interpreted by a browser. So from Wikipedia, here we have a really simplified diagram of the internet. We have, have our websites living on servers. Those websites get sent through the clouds of the internet, and they end up at client devices, browsers on phones, browsers on laptops, all kinds of places. We're sending responses over a network to be interpreted by a browser. More abstractly, our website is conversing with a client. You can think about the interaction between a server and client as a conversation. We're sending an HTML document. That's the agenda for the conversation that you're going to have with the browser. Uh, and I'll be talking about how we can compare that conversation that servers have with browsers to the conversations that we as, as web developers have with our clients, our, our end customers. More abstractly as well, a website is informing, an uh, informing the world about an organization. A website for a nonprofit is informing the world about that nonprofit organization. A website for a store is informing the world about that store. And if that organization has difficulty informing the world in general about what it does, why it does it, in a fast, concise way, it's probably going to have difficulty informing the world about what it does on the internet. If a store has difficulty selling products in an efficient manner in the real world, in their physical stores, the odds are good that they're going to have a difficult time efficiently selling their goods on the internet. So let's jump into the server side. Raise your hand if you've been developing a website and shortly before launch you hear from your client or someone on the team, the website is too slow. You're ready to go live, but then you hear, the website is too slow. And that's an amorphous statement. So the first thing you do is ask, well, why is the website too slow? And we're going to be asking this over and over again. This presentation isn't why your site specifically is slow, it's asking why and why and why again. Why is a website slow? Why might it be slow? So one answer to the question, why, is, well, the server is not responding fast enough. Again, a website is just sending responses over a network to be interpreted by a client. One of the reasons it could be slow is that initial response isn't coming fast enough. And in the Web 1.0 world, in the 90s, this answer might be, the answer to this question why might be, there's a limit to how fast a .html file can be read off of a hard disk. That might be your answer in a, in a Web 1.0 world. In 2016, the answer is more commonly, well, the requested URL is not in Varnish. If I'm asking for an about page on a website, that's, that should be a common request. A website should be able to respond instantaneously, here is the about page of this website. The website shouldn't have to think too much about how to respond, tell me about yourself website. But sometimes the requested URL has not been cached in its entirety. So let's, let's talk about Varnish because it's just one example of this concept of caching entire pages. So again, websites are simply responding 
from servers to clients. Varnish is a reverse proxy caching tool that can sit in front of your website. It can sit in front of your Drupal site, watch traffic coming in and out. So if Varnish sees a request for slash about, and it has seen that request recently, it can respond immediately. It can say, I, I know about this website. I've seen a request for slash about before. I will immediately respond with a full HTML, instantaneous response. The website should be fast. Maybe the request, though, is a request that Varnish hasn't seen ever or hasn't seen recently, in which case it goes back to your server, to your Drupal website, and says, I haven't seen a request before for slash about, or I haven't seen it recently. Can you build me the slash about page so I can then pass it along to the client? So if your problem is the, response, the HTML response is too slow, and the reason why is your HTML, HTML page isn't in Varnish, or it's not in your, your full page cache, you have to ask why again. And when you ask why again with Varnish and many of these other tools, the, the answer is going to have to do with the HTTP headers of your response. So Varnish relies on HTTP headers, metadata about the communication uh, of the response itself. So if this response for slash about or any other page says in its metadata, in its cache header, uh, I can be publicly cached for 900 seconds. What we're looking at right now is, is a, a tool from, from Pantheon that lets you inspect your website headers, find out is Varnish working. So I know from this cache control header that this website said I can be publicly cached and I can be publicly cached for up to 900 seconds. And I also know from Varnish that this particular page has been cached or is, is at least uh, six minutes and 26 seconds old. So great, this page is fully cached. But sometimes uh, the page isn't cached and, and then you need to dig into, well, why isn't it cached? So what we're looking at here is the performance page from Drupal Core itself. This is probably familiar to, to people building Drupal sites. You've got this control for uh, what's the, uh, the cache age, what's the maximum something can be cached. 15 minutes, 900 seconds, that's that cache control header we just saw. So if our HTML response is not in Varnish, we keep asking why, they're bad or limited HTTP headers, perhaps we have to be purging our cache over and over again. So it's common on a lot of sites to purge a Varnish cache every time an article is added, because maybe that article needs to appear on the front page, and we don't know with enough detail the rules around why something might appear on the front page. So every time an article is saved, we just have to clear all of our caches because maybe this article has to appear on the front page. We may not know where a node is used. If we don't have enough information, enough metadata information about what exactly we're doing, we're going to have to purge our caches more frequently. Our website is going to be slower. To, in order to make a website fast, you need to define with as much specificity as possible exactly what we're doing. So here's a quote that's probably not from Einstein, but it gets attributed to Einstein a whole bunch. If I only had one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. So in Drupal core uh, in eight, we've got a better problem, uh, a better answer. So if our problem is that Varnish can't cache pages reliably because we have poor page level metadata because we don't know does this page use a node or not. We don't know so we just have to purge all of our caches. If we have poor page level metadata, it's probably because we have poor element level metadata. If we don't know what are the, the nodes in a list uh, and that list is on a page, then we're probably going to have to clear the entire page because we don't know the metadata about the individual elements making up the page. In Drupal 8, we have this cache metadata system, a system that allows us to identify on a block by block level, really at a, a render array by render array level, what are the pieces of metadata that this element depends on. So we can know that maybe this main area of the page simply depends on the user permissions, uh, what role are you logged in as, and what's your URL. Whereas your shopping cart may be cached per user. By identifying what are the dependencies, uh, what are the cache pieces of cache metadata, uh, we can be much more specific about our caching. So in Drupal 8, we have this concept of cache 
tags. These are the data dependencies. A way of identifying that this element depends on node 123. We have cache context, which is a way of identifying the global dependencies, saying this uh, shopping cart depends on this user ID. That's global to the whole request. I'm logged in to this entire page as user 456. The shopping cart depends on uh, my user ID, so I know that this rendered HTML depends on the user ID being 456. And finally, max age. How long can we cache each element? So for each element on the page, we can answer what are its data dependencies. If the data changes, if node 123 is saved again, then everything that relies on node 123 has to be invalidated. If the cache context change, if we have a new global user ID, then we need uh, a different cache. What's the max age? How long can we cache each thing? At the code level, it looks like this. So we still have render arrays in Drupal 8. We still build up render arrays in, in a similar fashion. You can identify this uh, render element depends on node 123 or depends on the user permissions of the logged in user. And perhaps you can cache something forever as long as nothing else changes. Maybe you can only cache it for, for 900 seconds. So. To quote Wim Leers, one of the main implementers of, of this system, Wim along with Fabian Franz, implemented this system and they say, in Drupal 8, if you're rendering something, you must think about cacheability. Really, that should be true across the board. In any system you're in, if you're rendering something, you should be thinking about what are the rules around caching this. In Drupal 8, we simply have much better tools for answering that question. So, uh, keeping going with, with our, our problem statement. So, sometimes requests are going to get all the way to Drupal. Varnish won't be able to do everything for us. Sometimes we are going to have to process an entire page and that response itself might be too slow. So, uh, oh, but, but before I get there, one, one more set of thoughts on why you might not have Varnish. So, you might not have Varnish because you're running on custom infrastructure. You might not have Varnish because your custom infrastructure doesn't have the internal expertise. Your internal team doesn't have the know-how to implement Varnish. Varnish is a, a niche tool. Not, a, not everyone knows how to implement Varnish. I don't want to implement Varnish myself. That's why I like Pantheon, because other people at Pantheon worry about it for me. Uh, often these, these internal problems are the result of internal politics. Uh, one way I like to think about it is, what's the number of sites that you have to have at which it becomes cost-effective to hire someone who knows Varnish? Varnish is a tool that you need expertise in order to implement. If you're only running what, run, one website, I wouldn't recommend having someone on staff keeping up with the latest and greatest in Varnish. Pantheon, we're running over 100,000 websites. It makes sense for us to have people who can keep up with Varnish. Uh, are there decisions that you can make that will make your team faster and your website faster. Uh, we think for a lot of organizations, putting their sites on Pantheon will make the site faster because it gets varnish, it gets a lot of other performance tools, and the teams can work faster because they no longer have to worry about implementing these tools themselves. All right, so with that out of the way, back to what it happens when you get all the way to Drupal. The site might still be slow, and you ask why again, the answer might be, well, there are too many, too many files, too many modules. Maybe you hear that there are too many queries or that you have slow queries. Too much memory is used. You've got too many nodes on your page. You've got too many function calls, too many calls to the same function. And with each of these, we have to ask why and why again. So why do we have too many queries? The answer might be we don't know why we have too many queries. I recommend using Devel module. Devel module is available for just about every version of Drupal. I, I think it's, it's been around um, since at least Drupal 5 or Drupal 6. It gives you the ability to print out all of the queries that are run on a page. I recommend turning this on for just about all development work so that you can track what queries are being run. Uh, I recently uh, uh, helped out a site that didn't know why it was slow. 6,000 queries were being executed on a page load. And that's not the kind of thing you catch unless you are checking. Before you can answer the question, why do we have so many queries, you need to just know that you have a whole bunch of queries. Uh, that, that site with 6,000 queries uh, basically had a, had a coding bug that would generate a query for almost every single node 
added on the site. So as the site is being built, there are only a couple nodes. Nobody notices that there's a query for every single node on every single page. As the site grows to 6,000 plus nodes, suddenly we've got 6,000 queries. Without turning on these tools, you won't even know that you have too many queries. In Drupal 8, we've got Web Profiler, which is part of the develop package, which gives us this, uh, this handy toolbar that I, that I think is uh, even easier to use than develop module in Drupal 7. It'll let you know how many queries are being run on this site. So uh, let's dig a little bit deeper. There are too many queries. Why are there too many queries? Well, maybe we're loading too many nodes from the database. That's a common answer to the question, why are there too many queries? on this page. We're loading too much. Well, if you can get to that level of specificity, if you can say, well, we're loading too many objects, then there are answers for that. We have modules for that problem if you can describe the problem at that level of specificity. You can say, we've got entity cache module and we've got Redis. These are our answers to the problem of we're loading too many objects. Redis will allow us to cache objects request to request and the page can be run faster. Once you get to a certain level of specificity, you get a better answer. So another take on the question or the problem of Drupal is responding slowly. Maybe it's not too many queries. Maybe the problem is one really slow query. And maybe the, the one really slow query is coming from views module. Views is, is a leaky abstraction. A couple of years ago, Jeff Eaton, a prominent Drupal developer, wrote a great blog post on the leaky abstraction that is WYSIWYGs. So WYSIWYGs give us visual tools for editing HTML. We don't necessarily have to think too deeply about the HTML being produced by our WYSIWYGs until we have a problem with it. And then we have to suddenly think, what HTML is actually being created by this WYSIWYG? We have a similar situation with Views module. Views module lets us abstract away many of the details of SQL. I find myself being worse and worse at writing SQL the longer that I use views. Before I was working in Drupal, I wrote my own SQL queries. As soon as I got into Drupal, I found views module, and suddenly I'm no longer writing SQL queries. I no longer think about it because views does it for me. Uh, views generates pretty complex queries. Turning on one more filter or adding one more relationship may take your query from executing in a millisecond or two milliseconds or three milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. Without checking, without looking to see how long is this query taking, you won't know when that happens because uh, if a query jumps from 300 milliseconds or three milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, if you're just editing your view in the admin UI, it will be difficult to discern, is this, is this slowness coming from just Drupal as a whole because I've got admin menu turned on and admin menu is making my site slower or did this query jump from three milliseconds to 300? So just turn on the timer. Views modules UI gives you a timer right there but you have to turn it on. Uh, I kind of wish it was just turned on by default. So uh, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. Maybe you have one really slow query because you actually do have one really complex requirement. Let's think about that uh, feature request of, I want a related news block. How easy is it to describe what related news means? If you can describe what related news means for a site succinctly, there's a good chance you'll be able to query for it performantly. If you can say that our site has a primary vocabulary, every single article is tagged in one and only one taxonomy term in that primary vocabulary, related news is just the latest articles in that one vocabulary term. You can query for that pretty fast, and you can explain it clearly. But if related news means a combination of three different vocabularies, if you have to account for the author of the story, if you have to account for the day of the week, the more factors you take into account for what something means, you're going to be slower. Uh, one way or another, uh, the more complexity you add conceptually, the more uh, complexity you're adding technically, the slower something is going to run. So Drupal is still responding too slowly. Maybe the answer is too many modules. That's a common answer you'll get when you ask the question, why is this site slow? Well, we've got 300 modules. That's simply too many modules. And I, I guess I agree, uh, 300 modules is a lot. That site probably is going to have a hard time running fast. Uh, 
the the Drush site audit tool that, that Pantheon uses in our dashboard is going to complain after 150 modules. But that number is kind of arbitrary. And I, I'm much more concerned about the the intellectual, the mental overhead of having 300 modules. Yeah, that's that's 300 more modules to ask, do you have this hook, do you have this hook, do you have this hook? That's going to add some performance time, but it's going to add a lot more mental overhead to your development team to keep track of. Uh, we're using panels module and display suite and context and the core block system in some places. If it takes you five minutes to just remember how this page is generated because there are so many modules affecting how the site is rendering, yeah, that's going to add some rendering time, but much more than that, it's going to add mental overhead to your team. You'll have a hard time reasoning about how your site is built, and you'll have a hard time coming up with ways to make it faster. If it's difficult for you to keep track of how this site is put together, you're going to have a really hard time thinking about how can we make it faster. So. With overlapping duplicate modules, there's probably a lack of clarity amongst your team. Uh, if someone added panels module, someone else adds display suite, that's an indication that there's not enough communication happening, and you're going to add more performance problems in other places. So can you treat slow like a bug? If you find this site has 300 modules, some of these modules are duplicate, some modules we're not even sure if they're actually doing anything. Can you treat that slow like a bug? Do you have tests for what you expect each module to do? Can you look through your Git history the same way you would look through your Git history to find where a bug was introduced? Can you look through your project management tickets? Ideally, your Git commits are referencing project management ticket numbers that will let you know, oh, we added display suite because uh, of this ticket, we needed to do this thing, that's why it's there. If you, if you can get to that metadata, if you can get to that uh, information that you would need to solve a bug, you may be able to make your site faster. Uh, do you have documentation on the modules that you're using? So ultimately, I think the, the topic boils down to slowly not being defined. Why is this site responding slowly? Well, because we never defined what slow means. If your team is struggling to define requirements across the board, you're going to have a hard time defining what performance means. Do you know what user personas are using your site? Do you know what the acceptance criteria are? Do you have strategies for testing all aspects of the site? How do you know if the site is secure? How do you know if it's accessible? How do you know if it behaves as expected? Who is using your website and is it fast? Often performance gets treated as uh, its own category. Sometimes you may have a performance sprint at the end of the site. We've built the site and, uh, and now we're gonna make it fast. I think that's an inefficient way of doing things. Uh, you shouldn't, just as you shouldn't have a security sprint, you shouldn't assume that you're coding insecure code and, and at the end we're going, we're going to make it secure. You shouldn't assume that all of your code is slow and at the end you're going to make it fast. So let's, let's jump now to the client side of things. So what's on the agenda? Again, when we're talking about websites, we've got a server responding over a network to a client. The server is starting a conversation. That HTML document is the agenda for the conversation that your website is going to have with the browser. The website is saying, in order to understand this page, in order to understand this meeting that we're having, these are all the assets you need to download. First, here's my entire HTML page. What we're looking at here is the Chrome developer tools turned on to Drupal.org. This is just my Drupal.org uh, user dashboard. So we, we can see that because I was logged in, Drupal itself had to respond and generate that whole page, so it took uh, almost an entire second just to get the HTML. And then once the HTML is downloaded, the browser can see, okay, I'm going to need a couple CSS files, I'm going to need a couple JavaScript files, I'm going to need some images in order to understand uh, this page, okay, and a couple more JavaScript files. With this uh, numbers-based way of looking at things, it's really tempting to get hyper-focused on the numbers. With Chrome Developer Tools, with Yahoo's YSlow, with Google's PageSpeed, and with this tool, SiteSpeed.io, uh, a tool that I like myself, it's really easy to get focused on what are the numbers that are read, how can I make them small. Uh, if, your, if your problem statement is that the front end of the website is too slow, you may answer that with, 
well, there are too many CSS files, or the CSS is taking too long to load. The site simply has too much CSS files. Those numbers that were red, we want to get them green, we want to get them smaller. You come to the unhelpful conclusion that the website is fat. So Mark Drummond, uh, a prominent Drupal developer who, who gave a talk yesterday on responsive images, says, I'd like to stop talking about fat sites, not only because that language hurts my feelings, but because this oversimplification obscures key ways that we can make, make websites faster. Thinking only in terms of the, the total size uh, obscures what's happening under the hood. So if our CSS is taking too long to load, if the site has too much CSS, maybe we have unused CSS rules and we're, we're calling the site fat, but maybe the website has unused CSS rules because we're afraid to edit the CSS. Who here has ever been tasked with editing CSS opening the CSS file, I've definitely done this, where uh, I, do, I have no idea what's happening in the CSS file. So I simply add to the bottom more specific <laughs> CSS selectors. I don't want to mess anything up. I'm afraid that I'm going to break something. So I'll simply add more specific selectors to the end. It does what I want, I think, and then I move on to the next thing. I'm afraid of the CSS. So Wraith is a visual regression testing tool. This is a tool that lets you compare two, two URLs and see if they are visually different. I consider this to be a performance tool. I, I stumbled upon it uh, after, after hearing about it in DrupalCon Los Angeles as, as a tool that you can use after you make your security updates, make sure that, that nothing broke. Well, you can do that as well as you're editing CSS. If you can delete CSS with confidence, your site is going to be faster. It's really tempting when we're dealing with front-end performance to talk about advanced techniques, really uh, cutting-edge ways to aggregate things, to compress things. And that's much more appealing than just asking, can we do less stuff on this page? Do we even need this JavaScript library anymore that was added years ago? Do we know where our JavaScript is coming from? In, uh, in earlier versions of Drupal, it's pretty common to, to use this pattern where a module will watch hook in it and on every single page initialization add JavaScript, add CSS. And that's especially problematic in a module uh, where the JavaScript being added or the CSS being added is only going to apply itself on the, the front end of the site. Maybe you're adding libraries even on administrative pages that are not going to be used. Uh, if you're not thinking with specificity about where where is this JavaScript going to be used, it's probably making the site slower. In Drupal 8, we're enforcing this best practice of only attaching CSS, JavaScript, other front-end libraries to individual page elements. So rather than saying, this JavaScript, this CSS is for everything, you're saying this JavaScript and CSS is only for this render element. And this gives us more flexibility. Our, our basic options when it comes to JavaScript and CSS files that we can serve all of them individually. If you uncheck those aggregate CSS, aggregate JavaScript checkboxes in Drupal core, you're going to serve CSS and JavaScript all individually. Modules and themes are providing a bunch of individual CSS files. You can do that. Each one is cached separately, meaning you could give them really long cache lifetimes with uh, unique caches, uh, but you get lots of HTTP requests, and that's, that's problematic. If you have 30 individual CSS files, making 30 individual requests is going to be problematic. Another end of the extreme is to, for every single page, package up all of the CSS and all of the JavaScript into one single file. Now as you move from page to page and different uh, partials are being added to that one file, you're probably creating uh, different package CSS and JavaScript for every single page. So great, you've cut down the number of HTTP requests per page, per page, but you're guaranteeing that every single page has a unique set of CSS and JavaScript. So you get one HTTP request, but you get poor caching. In Drupal core, we basically split the difference. In uh, in that Chrome Developer Tools screenshot we saw earlier, there were multiple CSS files and multiple JavaScript files, even though aggregation was being turned on. And I think that's a decent answer. The question we have to ask ourselves is where 
Are we implementing these decisions? Who's responsible for these decisions? If you use Drupal core and leave those boxes checked, your performance is going to be decent, at least as a, uh, as in respect to the aggregation of those files. Now, uh, some people, myself included on some sites, I want even more control than Drupal 8 is going to give me, so or, or any version of Drupal is going to give me. So I'll implement my own grunt file, I'll implement my own gulp file, and take total control of how these front-end assets are being aggregated. Well, now I own this decision. I own, for the rest of the, the life of this website, the maintenance of a gulp file, the maintenance of a grunt file, Drupal would have handled this for me. I wouldn't even have to think about it. Uh, maybe I'm making my site faster, but I'm also probably making myself a little bit slower in, in my building of the site. You can't always make your site faster and your team faster. Ideally, you can make a decision that will make both faster, but taking ownership of CSS and JavaScript aggregation away from Drupal is putting another thing on your plate of responsibility. And you don't always want to do that. So if the problem is that the front end is too slow, your answer may be that there are too many third-party widgets. Why is that a problem? Uh, if we're dropping YouTube embeds, if we're dropping Twitter uh, share links, if we're dropping uh, a third-party search tool in the middle of our HTML, why is that a problem? Well, uh, from the Google Developer Docs, when a browser is parsing HTML and it comes across one of these third-party JavaScript scripts or, or even something that you're hosting on your own website, it has to pause the parsing of the HTML. Go get that script, uh, process it, and then continue on. Uh, imagine if you're having a meeting with your client and most of your stuff, most of your assets, you uh, load it up front, you told them all of the, the files, all the documents that they're going to need to reference in the course of the meeting, but then in the middle of the meeting, you say, oh, we've, we've got one more, one more document. We're going to have to run down to the third floor of the building, get it, come back. You're pausing, you're pausing the flow. Um, and that's especially problematic with, uh, with JavaScript share widgets. These are, these are my least favorite third-party widgets because if you want a Twitter share link, if you want a Facebook share link, that is simply a link. And uh, all, of these, all of these social media platforms will give you a little bit of JavaScript that you can drop in. It looks great. It's a cool-looking button, but it's uh, as of March 2015, so a year ago, Facebook is going to add three files with its share widget and uh, 73 kilobytes. That's problematic, uh, especially when all we're talking about is a link that you could render server-side. Is it worth it to your site uh, to, get, to get that share link from, from someone else? Often the developer doing the implementation, myself included, I've done this, I've said, okay, fine, I'll just use the share link from Twitter because all I need to do is copy-paste that code, drop it in the site. I'm making myself the developer, the team, move a little bit faster at that moment in time. The site is now moving slower, but uh, am I responsible for that, or is the person who told me to do it responsible? So if the problem is that there are too many third-party widgets, maybe no one feels responsible for them. Uh, maybe you as the developer think, someone asked me to to drop in this JavaScript that lets me share across 20 social media platforms. Yeah, it makes the site slow down by a second and a half, but now I don't have to worry about it. Well, Conway's law tells us that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of this organization. If across your organization people have a hard time identifying who's responsible for what, that's going to manifest itself in the website. If you have too many third-party widgets because you have too many analytics trackers, if you've got uh, Google Analytics, you've got Omniture, you've got Chartbeat. Maybe you have those because there are different groups of people using each one and they don't talk to one another. That's not a problem that you as the developer can solve if someone just says, hey, the website is slow, make it faster. Uh, I ran Google Y slow and said we have too much JavaScript. Well, maybe you have too much JavaScript because you've got teams that won't talk to one another. That's not a problem that the developer can solve in the last week of the project. So. Uh, ask yourself, it, in our meetings, do we add agenda items ad hoc? Do we have factions who ignore one another? Uh, I, I recently heard about uh, a prominent news site that had 
multiple versions of jQuery loading onto each page because they were added by different teams at different points in time and they didn't have a way of addressing that. Well, those teams probably weren't talking to one another. That problem is going to manifest itself on the website. Do you have people interrupting one another in the course of the meeting? If you do, there's a good chance you're probably going to have third-party widgets interrupting the processing of your HTML right in the middle. Uh, if you're repeating topics over and over, you're probably uh, repeating your CSS uh, in ways that are unhelpful. If you're starting your meeting as late, I think there's a good chance that you're going to have difficulty with varnish because the way you identify <laughs> problems related to timing, like the, if you have problems starting on time in the real world, you might have a problem starting on time on your website. It's, it's easy to think of websites as their own special thing. They're the technical thing for the developers to solve. Well, organ, organizations have to be able to answer problems like we do things slowly. And those problems are going to manifest themselves all over the organization. The website will simply be one manifestation. So, uh, I've, I'm adding a section on AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages, since the last time I gave this presentation. So, who, who here has heard about AMP recently? So, uh, this is a, a new initiative led by Google. A lot of major publishers have adopted it. The basic idea here is that we have an alternate version of a page. We've got uh, example.com slash some new article, and we've got example.com slash amp slash some new article. And that's an alternate stripped down version of the page that's going to load instantaneously. Well, okay, cool. Uh, everybody wants faster sites. Uh, we can add that, and we're going to get uh, better treatment in, in Google search results. Well, this sounds to me like history repeating itself. So. In 2004, maybe example.com had a fine desktop website. They had, they had just joined the CMS era, and it's a good website. And then by 2006, while well, adding new features is always easy, and removing features is really hard, so the site starts to get a little bit slower. In 2008, almost everybody in the newsroom has an iPhone, and the site is, is really slow on the iPhone, and that's, that's not acceptable. The site's too slow. Well, Adding new features is easy, removing features is hard. Maybe we can add the feature of an M. subdomain. I did this in, in this era. It was really easy with Drupal. All I had to do was install mobile tools, set up an M. subdomain, make a, a sub theme with slight customizations to the CSS, and suddenly I had a faster site. Uh, I did a theme override to load smaller images, and I felt good about it. Well those sites start to diverge. And suddenly, m.subdomains and the, the desktop site are growing further apart. There are different publishing workflows starting up. It's becoming too hard to manage. And by 2012, we throw our hands up and say, you know what, we have to start over. We need a responsive site. We're cleaning the slate. We're gonna have a good, simple, responsive site. By 2004 or 2014, adding new features is easy. Removing features is hard. And our site is suddenly slow. We designed it mobile first. But that's not the same as mobile forever. We've got a slow site, a slow responsive site in 2014. 2016, we can solve that by adding another feature. We can add the AMP feature. And to be clear, I'm going to implement AMP on the, the few sites I still control because I want a faster site. I want better treatment in, in Google rankings. But I think I see what's coming next. I think the AMP sites are going to start diverging. And to be clear, AMP is not a, a completely separate site. It's just articles or the articles you designate have an alternate version. Well, I think those features are going to keep creeping. Um, I, don't know what I, I don't know what we expected trying to solve the problem of too many features with another feature. Feature creep finds a way. I expect... Uh, I don't expect the accelerated mobile page to stay fast forever if we don't address the underlying problems of why sites get slow in the first place. So uh, here, here's another way of addressing the problem. How quickly can you get to a usable site? So this is a feature that's coming in, in Drupal 8.1. Uh, what we're seeing here is the big pipe feature. With that cache metadata that we were talking about early, uh, earlier, we can identify what parts of the page defend, depend on which uh, cache contexts. 
So if there's a section of the page that does depend on the user context and it's going to render really slowly, traditionally we have to wait for the entire page to render, uh, to render anything. We need to wait for the slowest part of the page. With BigPipe, we can send the fastest parts of the page first. Ideally, your main content is the fastest part of the page. And the slower parts, maybe a, a comment form or a sidebar depending on the logged in user, those can be sent uh, a little bit later. So uh, we need to keep asking ourselves why. Why is this site slow? How can we get to a faster uh, usable site? And how are we moving in the right direction? There we go. You know you're moving in the right direction if you can describe how your website is built. If it takes you five minutes to describe how the page is built and you have to reference eight different modules and all ten layers of pre-processing, then your site is going to have a hard time being performant. You're going to have a hard time making optimizations if you have a hard time describing how the page is built. I myself like to use the panel suite. It's not, uh, it's not a silver bullet by any means, but it helps me describe the way I'm building the, the site. I can describe the site as components inside of components inside of components. Uh, mini panels next to panelized view modes inside of page manager, inside of panels everywhere. That's one level of complexity, but it helps me reason about how I built the site in the first place. If I can track changes over time, if I know the site was loading at this speed a year ago and it's loading at this speed now, that's going to help me reason about what, uh, what aspects about my site have changed, what's making the site slower or faster. If you can estimate in advance the performance impact of a feature, if you can look at uh, the performance impact of a photo gallery on one site that you built and then estimate the performance impact of the photo gallery on the next site, that's going, to give you, that's going to give you more tools for having those conversations because this problem of performance isn't something that you can solve alone. The more information that you can bring to a conversation with the entire team, the faster your site is going to be. If you can start projects with performance limits, if you can set a hard cap on how, how slow will we let the site get before we have to refactor, you'll, you'll have an easier time. And if you can make decisions that make your site faster, and your team faster at the same time, then you'll be well on your way. Finally, if performance is a boring topic. I, I like performance, I like these technical details, but it shouldn't be a standalone piece. It shouldn't be the specialized sprint at the end. It should be something relatively boring that we just track all the way through. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Do you Chris. recommend taking over the queries that Fuse produces? So I, I would answer that with maybe you're making your site faster, but you're making yourself slower. So if you want to take over the queries that Fuse is using and, and optimize them, that will make that could make your site faster. You've added a significant chunk of time, first to even know that it's possible, to write the code that can do it. And I would also ask, what are you using views for if you are taking over the queries that views is writing? So views, at its heart, is a query builder and renderer. If you are taking over the query building part, if you know so much about the way views abstracts query building that you can alter it effectively, you probably could just write the query yourself. And that probably would be faster for you and faster for the site. So I've certainly done it myself. I've implemented just about every one of the views query alter hooks, and there are a bunch. Uh, but I, I don't feel good about it because I know I added time, I added complexity to the site, and I worry about the maintainability of, of that kind of coding. I think the maintainability of a, a custom written query is is one level of complexity, but maintaining um, a views config object and keeping track of the fact that there's an alter hook in one of your custom modules that really is needed, uh, that to me seems risky. Another thing to look for if you're doing caching in, within Drupal itself, mm -hmm. um, be very careful because 
loading something from the cache and deserializing that array is not free. Yes. Um, my favorite example here, I had a site where uh, they had a view that had caching enabled and 15 displays. It took 400 milliseconds to load the view in order to check the cache mm -hmm. and see you didn't need to do anything. Yeah. It would completely defeat the point. So, yeah. you know, be, be mindful of the cost of caching too. Yes. In, in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you won't know that if you're not looking. Right. You know, this, uh, the site the client came to us after the fact and said, yeah. why is this slow? And yeah. Then, well, here's why. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you talked about removing unused modules. Mm -hmm. um, that's sometimes easy when you know everything that's there. Mm -hmm. Often when you've inherited a site, it's a lot harder. Yes. Any, any good recommendations for tools to help audit? I I would be surprised if it if it were worth it. So just think about think about your billable rate and think about do you have a reasonable expectation that the site is going to get significantly faster? If you can do some initial profiling and see this module is making this site X much slower, then then maybe go after it. Or if it's a site that you're going to do significant more significantly more development on and you know that uh, you're, you're worried about the, the mental complexity of keeping track of all these modules, then, then yeah, maybe it's worth it. But if it's a site that's built and is just expected to run in its present state as long as it can be made to run, then removing modules probably w won't be worth it because you're introducing the risk that something breaks. Yes? Sometimes we run into a situation where um, some URL on the site is using too much memory, but we don't know what it is, and is evidenced by the server runs out of memory. You don't know which URL is triggering? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for tools to sort of almost monitor like an analytic way to, to mm -hmm. know? Yeah, so yeah, there are tools like New Relic, which do uh, performance monitoring, which, which can answer those kinds of questions. I'd also recommend just installing the site locally turning on develop module or, or web profiler, which will tell you, as you click around the site, how much memory is used for every single page. Thanks. Yeah. You mentioned towards the end the idea of uh, like setting some sort of performance budget. Mm -hmm. um, and when that comes up, I always wonder, like, what are some of the approaches to kind of coming to a number to rally on, especially when there are so many potential causes to what's going on? Uh, I'm working through that question myself right now. So the the Pantheon Docs page is a, is a GitHub repository, and it's a, a statically generated site. So uh, anytime a pull request comes in on our documentation, we have the ability to build the whole site, put it on a, a Pantheon multi dev URL, run our BHAT tests on it, run an accessibility suite, and uh, right now I'm in the process of adding sitespeed.io and I see a lot of red <laughs> and, and I want it to be green. Uh, so especially for a site that's, that's pre-existing, what I'm, what I'm working through right now is do I want to set like really, really easy metrics to pass just so I can get the testing tool itself in place at all and then incrementally make the budget harder? Uh, and introduce the, the fixes that will, will meet the harder budget, or do I want to set a hard budget and not even get testing in place uh, until the hard budget passes? I think what I'm going to do is somewhere, something in the middle. I'll look for the easiest fixes I can find, uh, implement those, set the budget there so at least we're not getting worse, and, and then progressively do what I can to um, address the harder problems and then set new baselines. Yeah. By a budget, you just mean a time post, like a load speed? Yeah, uh, we got a, uh, a speed. Well, we can look at at the file itself. So I'll, I'll jump to our documentation site. We'll see a pull request that I've started here somewhere, sitespeed.io. So right now, the test that I've added is failing. And the budget file looks like this, um, setting across the board like e each of the rules that sitespeed.io uh, runs, I think is converted to a, a percentage score. Uh, and I think by default it, 
it wants you to get to 90%. I've already lowered it to, to 60, but this pull request isn't merged. I don't know what this budget will look like in, in its final form. And each of the individual metrics can, can have its own line item as well. Any other questions? Great. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>